The San Blas Islands, or Cunayala, as it's called amongst its people, is an archipelago of 365 islands that lie off the coast of Panama in Central America. With only 49 of those islands inhabited, this enclave of postcard-perfect beaches is the home of the last endangered indigenous tribe of the Caribbean, the world-famous Kuna people. The Kuna Indians, also known as the Guna Indians, are a tight-knit, proud community. They won full independence from the Panamanian government in 1925 and have managed to preserve their unique language and traditions over the decades. Approximately 50,000 Kunas live in a secluded paradise untouched by modern influences such as electricity or internet, making them one of the world's most hidden and fascinating cultures alive today. For our visit, we leave Panama City in the morning for a 55-minute flight to El Porvenir Island, the capital of Cunayala, an adventure all in itself. Our first view is flying over the beautiful coastline of Panama City. Then comes the viridescent landscape of Panama. As we enter Kuna territory with its jungle intact, it feels as if we are traveling back in time. The Kuna have a great love and respect for nature, and it's their dedication to the earth that has allowed them to flourish for centuries. It's easy to see flying over the islands that global corporations have left this paradise untouched. The Kuna do not marry outsiders. They run all of their own small businesses, have their own flag, speak their own language, and abide by their own rules. Fasten your seatbelt as this island visit will be an experience like no other. Kuna friends come to pick us up and take us to their base island of Achutuku. As we pass even more beautiful islands filled with thatch-roofed huts on our way, one can understand why the Kuna have fought so hard to resist the pressure to westernize. Despite this, small group ecotourism has recently become a small source of income for the Kuna. Several tour companies fill tiny boats with curious visitors from Panama and Colombia, but few are able to give firsthand experience with the Kunas, who are fiercely protective of their culture. With the San Blas Islands falling outside of the Caribbean hurricane belt, the Kuna way of life hasn't changed much in over a century. And with a clean diet made primarily of bananas, breadfruit, yucca, coconuts, and fish, modern illnesses such as heart disease and cancer are extremely rare. Arriving on Achutupu, the Kuna women are happy to see us again. We have officially arrived in the land of Kunayala, the land of the Kuna people. It's no surprise the women are here to greet us, as the Kuna are a matriarchal society. Men also play an important role in Kuna society. Each island is led by a tribal chief called a Sila, a political and religious leader whose authority is officially recognized by the Panamanian government. Today, there are 49 autonomous communities in Kunayala. The entire region is governed by the Kuna General Congress, which is led by three caciques, meaning the three great tribal chiefs. 
Each of the 49 tribal chiefs are elected for life and serve as both the political and religious leader of the community. Men, women, and children are all taught how to sail using a canoe. The huts are built very close to one another with a path just wide enough to walk between them. Since space is limited, some of the largest islands only have about 500 kuna living on it. The average family size is 10 people, where all family members sleep together in one large room, each person in their own individual hammock. The Kuna have their own language called Thule, which is part of the Chibchan family of languages. Until recently, it was an unwritten language. Many Kuna also speak Spanish, particularly those who venture to the mainland to sell food or handcrafted goods. From too much sun. Most notably, Rose the Kunas have the cancer. world's highest rate of albinism, which occurs in approximately one out of every 142 children born on the islands. Nose rings are common among Kuna women. At birth, a girl's septum is pierced during Iko Ina, the needle festival. And at puberty, she receives a small gold nose ring to always remind her how precious she is. The ring gets larger with age, but they are always made of gold. In fact, gold is the most valued metal in Kuna society. They make their jewelry by pounding gold into flat pieces, then cutting out shapes. One-of-a-kind designs often correspond with images found in nature and celebrate Kuna mythology. The Kuna religion is filled with symbolism and myth. They believe in the Big Father and the Big Mother, but that they both live far away which is why evil spirits called pony can easily visit to cause illness and disease. However, during important celebrations, wearing gold jewelry associated with the images of the sun, moon, stars, animals, and other symbols can help keep those evil spirits away. And of course, the pieces are just fabulous to wear and equally stunning to look at. Panama has the lowest overall prevalence of tobacco use in the Americas. However, smoking rates are three times higher among the Kuna people. Nearly 30% of men and 10% of women enjoy smoking tobacco in pipes. On the island, smoking is considered an acceptable way to relax and celebrate the good life. And despite using the same tobacco that's sold in Panama, less than a dozen kunas have died from cancer over the past 25 years. <laughs> Tribal chiefs often visit one another to discuss local problems. Each chief travels with a spokesperson called a vocero and has an advisory board made of elders to help him govern the island. The stick this man carries indicates he is the one with the authority to enforce the rules. The traditional headscarf worn by Kuna women is called a muswe. It is a sign of respect to wear one in public at all times. The most common musways are red with yellow designs, but they also come in different colors. The musway can be worn on top of the head or over the shoulders if a woman is waiting for her hair to dry.
The tradition is for Kuna women to wear layers of gold during special occasions. It serves as a reminder to the rest of the tribe of just how precious it is to be female. Aristella and her sisters show off their huge engraved earrings, which are only worn at ceremonial celebrations. Bibi has the ultimate gold necklace of engraved panels joined with smaller emblems. As with other pieces, epic tales of Kuna history can be found in beautiful works of art, such as this necklace. All inheritance, including gold jewelry, passes down to younger generations through the mother's family. For daily use, Kuna women typically wear a gold ring on each finger in the shape of fish, birds, or butterflies. Men also wear small gold necklaces during special events. And women wear lighter jewelry when casually socializing. And with age comes more benefits. The oldest women on the island get the honor of wearing the largest nose rings, made of some of the purest gold found in the Americas. Sassy is picking a Niza pod from a tree, more commonly known as a naro. When opened, it reveals bright red oily kernels, which she smears on her cheeks. Not only is wearing Niza a way to enhance one's beauty, it's also to chase away the evil spirits. The Kuna women pride themselves with their face painting. Buna has painted a black line down the ridge of her nose and smeared her cheek with Niza. Nilda is also painting her nose using the fruit from the hagua tree. When the fruit is cut open, the juice turns black. And painted on the skin, this temporary tattoo can last up to 10 days before it needs to be reapplied. The tradition is very similar to the art of henna, or mendi, which has been practiced in Pakistan, India, Africa, and the Middle East for over 5,000 years. The most significant difference between the two is that instead of hagua juice, henna is made from the dried leaves of the henna plant. As for the kuna, nose lines are worn for all sorts of occasions. In fact, a similar nose line design was used for Nilda's wedding ceremony several years ago. The Kuna women also bead both their arms and legs. The beaded wrapping is formerly called yuinni, but now is more commonly referred to as shakira, a slang term that is believed to have originated from a kuna who visited the mainland to sell handcrafted goods and saw a photo of the famous Colombian singer wearing similar beads on a magazine cover. Kuna women are allowed to wear beads beginning the day after their puberty ceremony. Yards of string are looped through tiny glass beads, first on a wooden dowel that matches the woman's exact leg size. Afterwards, the beaded string is systematically wrapped and tied around the legs or arms, making intricate patterns with vibrant colors. The kunas love having their legs beaded. It's as close to wearing fancy leggings as one can get. 
Despite being part of a matriarchal society where women are decision makers, property owners, and merchants, taking the time to celebrate one's beauty is considered a sign of strength among the Kuna. However, Kuna women are still responsible for cooking, cleaning, washing dishes, child rearing, bringing water from the mainland rivers, and making their own clothing, all without electricity or running water, in addition to all the responsibility of running a traditional household. In the early 1900s, the Panamanian government tried to ban the kuna from wearing beads, headscarves, traditional dresses, or to practice their religious beliefs. In response, the tribes gathered together with force and revolted in what became known as the Tule Revolution of 1925. Soon after, the Panamanian government reversed their efforts and granted them autonomy over the San Blas Islands. Today, the Kuna are seen as an indigenous community to be cherished and protected. Just like the Western world, Kuna women express their individual personalities and preferences by wearing a unique style of clothing and accessories. It's a look so distinct and beautiful that Kuna fashion is recognizable across the globe. The Kuna are most famous for making molas. Mola is the Kuna word for both blouse and clothing and is best described as a method of reverse applique. In fact, mola making is the most recognizable expression of visual art in the Americas. The design is formed by sewing together two to eight different layers of cloth and then cutting out and stitching together various shapes on the different layers. The more layers of cloth and cutouts, the more intricate and time-consuming it is to sew. Images on the designs can be anything the individual Kuna fashion designer wishes to create. Many pieces feature birds, fish, people, scenes, and symbols. Each one-of-a-kind design can take from one week to six months to sew. In comparison, Kuna men prefer wearing understated Western clothing, such as plain shirts, jeans, or shorts. Hats are a smart accessory for many men, and button-down dress shirts with colorful business ties are a favorite among the tribal chiefs. Men also enjoy the process of creating handcrafted goods, particularly weaving baskets, carving utensils, and creating wood carvings. Here, a medicine man or shaman patiently weaves his own basket to collect healing barks and herbs from the jungle. Kuna handcrafted baskets can be made of many different materials from the islands or jungle and come in a variety of different designs. Here's an example of a different style basket. It's amazing what can be created when nature provides the raw materials and man provides the creativity. The shaman shows us the use of different tools and explains to us what the different types of bark are used for. In one case, the arrowhead-shaped piece of wood is used to cure headaches. 
tiene que poner en el agua. When sickness occurs, the shaman is summoned to the hut to evaluate and diagnose the illness. If he feels it is necessary, he will travel to the jungle to obtain the medicine he requires before attending to the sick individual. The chief religion among the Kuna is animism, meaning they believe that everything in the world, including rocks, lakes, rivers, and mountains, all have a soul. Since Kunas believe that spirits live in trees, a large tree will have a powerful spirit, so he must do a ritual prayer and ask permission before cutting a piece of healing bark. In the Kuna tradition, shaman are taught from an early age how to identify plants and the many ways they can be used to heal or prevent health problems. This concept is not primitive at all. More than 7,000 Western medications currently in use were originally derived from plants. A significant percentage of those came directly from the jungles of Central America. Kuna medicine men simply used the original form of these plants to cure ailments by making teas and tinctures for patients to consume. The shaman then carries his basket down the hill before making the journey back to the islands. Every Kuna family has a box of medicine dolls carved from balsa wood called nuchus. Shamans use a combination of herbs and chants to heal their patients. Even cacao beans are a part of the healing process. The medicine man is chanting over a sick girl to chase the spirits away that have caused the sickness. The urn is burning cacao beans. The smoke is to please the good spirits, and behind her hammock stands a box of medicine dolls. The mother or the grandmother will always assist the shaman in the healing ritual. The entire region only has one Western-trained hospital for major emergencies, but there are several clinics throughout the region. Many Kuna combine both Western and Kuna approaches to healing when they are seriously ill. Ulus, or dugout canoes, are the main mode of transportation for the Kuna. These hardwood vessels are made by hand and are carved from a single tree trunk found on the mainland. Each Kuna community has a craftsman who builds canoes upon request. Younger generations must also learn and master the skills of canoe making through observation and eventually apprenticeships. This Kuna man is making his own canoe using several modern day tools to carve and shape the inside of the canoe. Older canoes not in use are used for other tasks, such as washing clothes, bathing children, or even storing fruits and coconuts. When a Kuna family needs a new house, the entire community comes together to build it. All the materials are brought from the jungle. Solid tree trunks are bound together with behugo twine, not nails. Walls are made from bamboo or cane, and a thatch roof is made from dried palm leaves. The hut takes a day or two to build, and can accommodate large families housing multiple generations. The cost of building a new house? Nothing. 
All raw materials and labor are free. Huts are built very closely together, giving new meaning to the term zero lot lines. Since there are no fresh water sources on the island, Kuna women collect drinking water from rivers and water holes on the mainland. The responsibility of collecting water is often an all-day affair, and the journey can be miles away. The Kuna men are excellent fishermen. Their catch is cleaned and smoked by the women to preserve them for later use. Their cooking hut is always separated from the main house in case of fire. The Kuna engage in sustainable fishing practices by default. They only catch the amount of fish needed for the short term. As with other meats, the Kuna smoke their fish as soon as it is caught, as there is no refrigeration on the island. Huge quantities of bananas are brought out from the jungle farms to the island on a regular basis. The bananas are carried from the dock to the designated kitchens, where a group of women get them ready for the cooking pots. The kunas are rarely over five feet tall, but their strength is simply amazing. This farmer has carried loads of bananas weighing up to 150 pounds, capable of traveling many miles from his farm on the mainland. Andreas grows pineapples, bananas, and sugarcane, but today he's digging out cassava roots to take home to his family. Cassava, more commonly known as yuca, is a staple food for the kuna. It's refreshing to see a kuna man using modern day appliances in the kitchen. Here, this baker is preparing bread as a special treat for the members of the island. For centuries before this, the Kuna used mud stoves, even as recently as the 1970s. Iguanas are also smoked and preserved just like fish. This hunter has returned from the jungle with his catch of wild turkey and monkey. His wife will grill the meats and most likely serve it with rice and boiled bananas in coconut milk. Letty is busy peeling green bananas. while her son-in-law is husking and opening coconuts, which she will later grate and generate coconut milk for cooking. Coconut milk is commonly used to boil bananas, yuca, and many other food items for flavor. There's always time for a quick drink of coconut water. The coconut pulp is mixed with water squeezed hard, then strained, and the milk is added to the bananas. Letty will also add smoked fish and make it the meal for the day. Hungry family members eagerly wait for dinner. Sometimes Kuna men help with the cooking, such as preparing fried eggs and assisting with other domestic chores. Kuna women use fans to keep the cooking fires burning strong. 
In addition, fans are used to stay cool, keep bugs at bay, and to fan cooking smoke away from their faces. As in Western homes, the cooking hut is also the primary location for socializing. In preparation for big events, cooking starts literally days before. A Kuna woman is getting her hair cut in preparation for a family member's coming of age party. As an older sister, this woman is getting her hair cut short like most other adult Kuna women. Short hair is a sign of adult femininity and is a true blessing during the hot summer months. Big celebrations are a time for everyone to socialize from different islands, so outdoor beauty parlors such as this one become rather busy right before the big event. The upcoming puberty ceremony called Inasui is one of the Kuna's most sacred traditions. It occurs approximately three times a year to celebrate the girls who have transitioned into womanhood and lets the entire region know they will soon be available for marriage. It is also the moment that a Kuna female receives her tribal name. The girl's family will provide the entire tribe with a multi-day festival of free food, alcohol, music, and dance. Many days of festivities requires many kunas to help in advance. The kuna believe getting drunk at major ceremonies is essential for obtaining salvation. The source of that bliss is their traditional alcoholic beverage called chicha. Unlike other countries who make chicha from other sources, the Kuna make theirs from fermenting sugar cane. They sometimes add coffee beans to give it a darker color. To make chicha, you first start with sugar cane, then comes the ingenious jungle press. Just jump, push, and twist. The juice is then transferred into large clay jars and allowed to sit for two weeks to ferment. Tasting of the chicha is an important part of the upcoming puberty ceremony. This group of townsmen do the sampling. If ready, the party can begin. Party preparations continue with the tying of jungle rope to be used for the shaman's special hammocks. And the painting of the ceremonial sticks. Even more bananas have arrived from the other islands. And with more than 800 mouths to feed, teamwork is everything. When it comes to chopping breadfruit, all of the ladies from the host island pitch in. Breadfruit is widely available as it is one of the few things that grows directly on the islands. For this reason, it is the most plentiful fruit of the Kuna diet. Delicious breadfruit can be prepared by frying or boiling it in coconut milk the same way as bananas. <laughs> K 
Kuna boys have no equivalent rite of passage for their transition into adulthood, but everyone still gets excited. The tribal chiefs wear pink and are out and about on the island. The huge cooking pots are only used during special ceremonies. Since the party lasts four days, all 800 guests have to be fed, so the cooking hut is kept going day and night. Six women sleep in the cooking hut so they can tend to the fires during the long night. This dance symbolizes the official start of the celebration. Dancers will perform several times throughout the days and nights using rattles and panpipe flutes during the performances. The girls wearing the white veils will go through the ceremony. Each one has her mother sitting next to her, and the two grandmothers in the back will do the haircutting the same way it has been done for centuries. They sit in a special enclosure, waiting for all of their hair to be removed. This is a very sacred process and is rarely filmed. The two shamans performing the ceremony enter the enclosure, dancing with pelican bone necklaces and blowing smoke on the families to chase away any evil spirits. They will continue chanting, dancing, and celebrating until the early morning hours. With the celebration of life comes the honor of death. Cemeteries and grave sites are located on the mainland, miles away from the islands. The burning pot at her feet once again contains cacao beans. Kuna women carry these fires for their entire journey in the canoe to ward off evil spirits and let positive spirits, such as their deceased loved ones, know they are coming. Elderly Kuna women are responsible for traveling to the grave sites and caring for the dead. They bring them food, drink, and keep their huts clean. Researchers estimate the average life expectancy for a Kuna female is 97 years old. For a Kuna male, it is 93. However, it is not unusual to meet a Kuna who has lived well past 100 years old. Small burial huts are furnished with tables and favorite objects. Everything the dead person has owned in life 
is buried with them. Dishes and cups are placed on top of the grave, ready for use in the afterlife. The Kuna pay their respects by chanting and prayer. Again, the Kuna use cacao bean smoke to appease their loved ones and ward off evil spirits at the burial sites. A child's toys are hanging on a rope so he or she can have something to play with in the afterworld. The views from the oceanfront grave sites are amazing. This man's reputation followed him into the grave. All he left behind were empty bottles. We can only imagine this person's favorite pastime, drinking. It's easy to get a sense of the individual when visiting a burial site. So much personality shines through. The children's dog has died and it is buried in the same manner. Kunas treat their pets as family members and honor them in the exact same traditional rituals. Above his grave, he has a bowl of water and cooked rice to keep him in his afterlife. The Kunas call themselves the Golden Ones, always happy and full of laughter. Children are the center of the Kuna community. The joy Kuna's experience with children extends to pets who instantly become part of the family. Just look at those earrings, how adorable. The Kunas simply love their pets. It's hard to imagine what it's like to live in a society without Western inventions. But it is easy to understand why the Kuna choose to stay connected to nature and all of its treasures. Luckily, the Golden Ones are still here to remind us all just how beautiful life should be.